Thank you, uh, everybody who shared, and uh, the musicians and the singers. Thank you so much, and thank you, Ottawa Church. Uh, it is great to be here this morning. I bring you greetings from the Hamilton Church of Christ. Uh, we love you guys. We're praying for you. We know it's you know a time of uh, transition and change in Ottawa, but uh, we know uh, we've seen ourselves. Uh, we've been through a period like that recently, and we've seen God, uh, you know, be faithful as He always is um, through that time and. Uh, and uh, in, in the last a couple of years, it's been really amazing to see um, the, the faith of, uh, of everybody in the church. My own, my own faith has been revived, really, in a lot of ways. And, uh, and I'm very grateful for um, uh, Danny and Jillian Brisebois, who have uh, moved from Montreal to lead the Hamilton Church. And uh, uh, Jillian's an old friend of mine, and, and Danny's a new friend. And, uh, and uh, we're, we're having a great time uh, as, they, as they lead us in the Lord there. So... Uh, Thank you for allowing me the privilege to speak to you this morning. Uh, I, you know, you may wonder, like, wh who's this guy and why does he come here every now and then to, to preach the word? And I, because I love you and I love preaching the word. And that's literally the only reason I'm here. I don't think I have answers for you. I have no agenda. I am not, you know, bucking for, uh, you know, to job in the full-time ministry or anything at, the, at all. I, I used to do that and, you know, I was kind of, Showing that that was not what God was calling me to do, but uh, he did. He does call us all to be, you know, uh, ministers of, of this new covenant that we're part of here. So I thought, you know, whatever it may be, I'm going to keep preaching the word, you know, and I actually love the work that I'm doing now in terms of my day job. It's all marketing kind of stuff, uh, basically sitting in front of a computer all day. Um, but I, I, I like that, but I love studying my Bible, and I love getting into it, and I love sharing uh, things that uh, God has allowed me to to understand and to see in the scriptures and, and uh, you know it's it's amazing how as you as you age in a Christian I, I'm com coming up on uh, uh, this spring it'll be 27 years um, uh, as a disciple and uh, you know you can come back to scriptures you've read hundreds of times before and still see new things God will still show us more as our lives change as our circumstances change. Um, there's more to be dug out of the scriptures. It's an endless uh, treasure, you know, and, and uh, the title of my message today is called Immeasurably More, which is what God is able to do. That's, that's borrowed from the pa uh, passage in Ephesians. You know, Jesus is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. I don't know about you, but I have a pretty good imagination. I can imagine a lot of good things that God might do, you know, but the Bible says God is able to do immeasurably more. Not only way more than you can imagine, it's like so much more than you can imagine that you can't even come up with a measurement for it. And we can measure some pretty big things, can't we? You know, we, if we, you know, we'll start doing, you know, scientific notation, if we need a really big number, if we start thinking about space and stars and so on, we'll come up with ways of trying, you know, we, we can't even get our minds around the things that we actually can measure. And God says, the things that I can do and the things that I'm willing to do and the things that I want to do through you and for you and with you are even more than, your, than the greatest stretch of your imagination. You know, sometimes it doesn't feel like that, though. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm experiencing um, all that God can, can do. And, and, you know, I think a lot of times we can make the mistake of thinking that what that what immeasurably more should look like in our lives you know usually if you leave it up to me it's going to look something like i'm the champ i'm doing awesome all the time and everybody loves me and god loves what i'm doing and it's just victory upon victory that that's kind of my version of what i would like to things to look like i think a lot of us kind of have that version but on in reality it has been quite different my, my life has looked quite different from the things that I would uh, like to have happen. I've had failures. I've had times of uh, not living up to, you know, not, not, not just God's standards, but my own standards for myself. And I've found that my weaknesses uh, have held me back at times and, and have humbled me or humiliated me. And uh, we find that life is not that always victory to victory to victory unless we hand it over to God. Uh, we're just, just back uh, from a nice week up in the Laurentians with, um, with my dad and uh, some of his friends who were gracious enough to invite our family along with, uh, uh, with them for a ski trip that my, my parents have been doing for many years. 
Um, unfortunately, this year, my mom's no longer with us. She passed away in September, which uh, was one of the, the, the greatest challenges of my life to, to, to lose my mom. And, uh, and uh, it, it's been tough, you know, but, but there's blessing in it. You know, there's things that God does through it. And even the hard times, God can, can bless. And, um, you know, it was, it was a bit bittersweet because it was really mom's, mom's dream for the kids to be able to, to get into skiing, which is something that I enjoyed as a kid. And my parents uh, enjoyed. Uh, my dad's 82. He still skis, unbelievably. Um, but, uh, you know, she really wanted that as a gift uh, for the kids. And uh, I'm sure she, before she left us, she told my dad, you take those kids again next year. So, so there we were back. Uh, unfortunately for my wife, uh, she spent the entire time in bed with a fever and the flu. And uh, we got went to the doctor here finally uh, the, uh, the other day, and it was uh, sinusitis. And she's in fact, and so she's resting at home uh, at uh, Rob and Danielle's place. Thank you so much, guys, uh, for hosting us. It's it's great to be able to uh, have, you know, to see old friends again. Uh, Rob and I were roommates back in Toronto once upon a time, and uh, we're, we're grateful for their, uh, their warm hospitality. Danielle, cooking, amazing. Just, we feel so encouraged, so loved up on. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, it was a fun vacation for everybody, except for my wife, who's really sick. But doing a little better, but still just, just not well enough to be with us today. Anyways, into our message, immeasurably more. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. You know, I was relying on, you know, I can relate to the brother who shared about, you know, having anxiety about, is my phone going to survive? Well, you know, sometimes you trust technology when you shouldn't, and sometimes you don't trust it when you should. I didn't trust Google this morning. It said, it said, you know, turn here. And I was like, I think we missed the turn already. And I got off and Google was like, no, you should have kept going. You turn, turn around. Go. So I didn't trust Google and I was wrong. And, but I trusted in my phone this morning to be my Bible. And now the battery's almost dead. So I had to borrow a paper Bible. So technology, you know, you love it, you hate it. What can you do? Matthew chapter 15. This is a, a, a passage in the Bible that has kind of troubled me for a long time, you know, because I didn't really get it, and I didn't ever really hear an answer that satisfied me about what is this passage actually about. And uh, it's looking at the, uh, the, the faith of the, sometimes referred to as the Syrophoenician woman or the Canaanite woman, uh, and we're going to read about her in, in verse 21. It says, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus <coughs> did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. So, it kind of looks like in this passage that Jesus is calling this woman a dog. He's kind of like, well, first, he's like, first thing he says nothing to her. She pray, she's pleading with him. <clears throat> and the disciples are like, Jesus, tell this woman to get out of here. She's bugging us. They obviously didn't have any, you know, healing plan for her in mind. She was a nuisance to them, a past. And somebody frankly, from a culture that they looked at as really ungodly. And to be truthful, it was a culture that was really ungodly. The Phoenicians, also known as the Philistines, were known to, be pra uh, to conduct the practice of child sacrifice. It was a common thing in ancient cultures for people to believe that in order for the crops to come, we've got to offer something to the gods. And so we're going to sacrifice a child or a human or something. This was very common in ancient cultures. And this is one of those cultures that God basically said, don't be like them, don't go near them, don't have anything to do with them. 
<coughs> because of their, these ungodly practices. So, in some sense, the disciples were, in their own eyes at least, justified in saying, get away from us, because that's what they understood God's instructions to be. You know, and sometimes God, the God that we think we understand today, reveals himself to us to be something more than what we have understood. Sometimes our, our, our view and our understanding of who God <coughs> is gets revolutionized. You know, I'm sure Abraham, as he was called, you know, to sacrifice Isaac, was thinking, well, that's what the gods call for. And at the last minute, God said, no, I'm not that kind of God. I am something else. And in this situation, Jesus is about to show the disciples the same thing. You know, there's a number of audiences here <coughs> to consider in this situation that Jesus is aware of <coughs> who is listening to him. There's the woman he's speaking to. There's his disciples <coughs> who are watching what Jesus is going to do for this woman. And then there's us. You know, Jesus knew that this story would be in the Bible later on. Amen? And <coughs> I think he is considering all of us. As God, you know, God's able to do that kind of thing. He's able to consider how his actions will affect different people. He's like, okay, what does this woman need? What do my disciples need to learn? And what's the lesson going to be <coughs> historically down the road? for people who are reading this in the scriptures. And he really m speaks to all of us and meets all of our needs in a very different way. I do believe there's a test here that Jesus is, is putting up for the woman. I've thought about this. I have some speculations about it, and I'd like to be clear what's scripture and what's my speculation. I think parents, I think it's fair to say that parents are the keepers, the safeguard of their children's spirituality. Children are innocent in scripture, but we see this woman having a daughter who is demon possessed. How did this evil influence get into her daughter's life? Perhaps it's something to do with the culture she was part of. Perhaps it's something to do with <clears throat> the spiritual failings of her mother or her parents, that they were participants in that culture. Whatever the reason, she was demon-possessed and the mother was desperate. <clears throat> and she is crying out. At first, Jesus says nothing. Sometimes we cry out to God and we feel like we get no answer. Sometimes our faith is tested. Sometimes God is, is waiting to see because he wants us to see for ourselves what it is that we're really after. There was no mistake for this woman what she was after. She was desperate. And, and wouldn't we all be for our child? Wouldn't we do, for those of us who have children, wouldn't we do anything at all for our children? Up to and including giving our lives for them. And so she is not put off, and she comes to him and begs, in spite of the fact that the disciples are saying, Jesus, get rid of her. Tell, tell her to go away. Now, I've got to give you a little context as well. If we look in the scripture, what has been happening in Jesus' ministry up to this time, you can actually trace it back to the time when John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, was killed by Herod. And Jesus had said to the disciples, let's go away to a quiet place where you can get some rest. And then if you remember that time, that was when all the crowds came to him and he had to do a miracle said to feed the 5,000 people that came. And then the 4,000 comes shortly after that. And then it says, you know, Jesus had withdrawn to this place in, in, up in, uh, near Tyre and Sidon, which is not even in uh, the, the, the Jewish area anymore. He's now, he's now in, out in the foreign countries. And maybe, we can, maybe we can get some rest here finally, but they've been looking to have some time of rest. So by this point, the disciples probably feel like, okay, Jesus, we get the persevering in the ministry thing, but, you know, you're still mourning the loss of your cousin, and we're really tired from all this traveling and work we've been doing, and we frankly deserve a rest, and just enough with the ministry, just tell her to go away. 
You know, and there's times we can feel justified to dismiss the needs that might appear before us at, at an inconvenient time. I, I know I can be pretty generous and good-hearted when, when I've had enough sleep and when everything in my life is going well and my phone is fully charged and, you know, my bank account's where I want it to be. I'm, I'm pretty much ready to go then. But, you know, you catch me on a bad day, I look like a different person sometimes. But Jesus always looked the same. But even their expectation of him was that, you know, they thought that he would be cool with sending the woman away. They thought, yeah, Jesus is going to surely dismiss this woman. Come on, Jesus, just tell her to go. We want to have our rest. And he, Jesus is testing the woman further. He says, I, because she comes to him and she says, Lord, you know, son of David, have mercy on me. Well, the son of David is reference to the Jewish Messiah who is going to become, who is the, the king. And she here's this foreign woman saying, son of David, you know, maybe perhaps trying to acknowledge that you are the one who has come. Or maybe trying to say, hey, like, I'm, I'm one of you guys too. And Jesus says, you know, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. He's like, I know you're not who you claim to be. Perhaps, or maybe he's trying to get the disciples to think about something. I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Well, who's Israel? Biblically, there is an Israel of the nation, and there's the spiritual Israel, which is all God's children, regardless of nation. So Jesus obviously knows that, and he's looking ahead. And so for her, it's a test, and for the disciples, Clearly, they probably assume that he is just following the same sort of national divide that they understood. These Canaanites are dogs. They're bad. They're, they're child sacrificers. Get them out of here. Yeah, Jesus, only the lost sheep of Israel. But a surprise was coming for them. But the test goes further for the woman. He says, you know, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. There's something interesting here. I am, I am no scholar of Greek, but there is an interesting word that's used for the word dog. Canarian uh, is the word, and it, but it means a little dog or a lesser dog. So a small dog. And so you think of all that's happening here. And say, you know, why would Jesus say, is it right to take the bread from the children and give it to the, to the little dogs? So who is she asking the favor for? Not for herself, really. She says, Lord, have mercy on me, but it's for her daughter. So if she's, he, Jesus is looking at his disciples and saying, guys, should I have mercy on, on her? What about the little dogs? What about the children born into a sinful culture through no fault of their own being influenced by it? Should, what about them? Should we even have no mercy on the children of our enemies? If we're not going to have mercy on our enemies, what about the little ones who didn't do a thing against us? Who didn't do a thing against God? I don't think they get that quite yet. But the woman says, you know, she's willing to own that. I mean, it's, it sounds harsher because basically to her, it looks like Jesus is saying, well, you know, dogs, you don't really merit the favor of God. And she's like, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> just even anything you could give me would be awesome. She, you know, her, her desperation is so great that, you know, she'll, she'll own that. She'll say, yeah, I'm a sinner. I'm a dog. I'm like, I blew it. Jesus, I made mistakes. We did the wrong thing. You're the son of God. Just please, just a crumb, just something small. And Jesus looks at her and says, wow, you have great faith. I think maybe that's when the moment happened that the disciples started to go, what? <laughs> you know, great faith. We thought she was a dog. We thought she was not the child of Israel. We thought she's going get, to get booted out the door. Go, Jesus, kick her out. And he says, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And I'm sure there was silence and mouths hanging wide open among the disciples as Jesus, who was truly sent for the lost sheep of Israel, restored the daughter of this lost sheep. Because everyone is a child 
whom God seeks for his family. And he really had put before them that moral choice. He's like, okay, guys, you're hung up on the, you don't want to help the ungodly culture. I get it. But the question is, am I going to take the children of Israel's bread and give it to the little dogs? Am I going to, am I going to help a child? Or should we just, you know, kick her out and you, we can get on with having our time of rest? It's so challenging to think, you know, the times when I'm selfish or absorbed in my own problems around view of the world or perhaps viewing somebody as not even worthy of my time or help because, you know, they kind of did it to themselves or whatever. And Jesus' heart of mercy is so much greater. You know, for, for him to go to this place and to, to continue persevering, to share with that one more person, to, to give grace and to give his favor to, what, to somebody that was not, like, his disciples didn't get it, really didn't get it. And we know that even later on, Peter was given the vision of being a minister to the Gentiles. And that whole, he sees not just this woman, but all of them, Peter, get out there. And it took, a, you know, visions from heaven to open up his mind to that reality. It took a long time for Jesus to get his disciples to realize the degree to which he wanted them to love people. You know, he really was a God who was immeasurably more than they had imagined. There's a, uh, a sister in uh, the Hamilton Church, uh, there's a couple, couple named Ryan and Peggy Hughes, and uh, it's, it's a really inspiring story. Uh, it's, it's quite unbelievable, actually. So I think it was over 20 years ago, Peggy's father was really told that due to organ, his organs not functioning, his liver not functioning the way it was supposed to, that he was only going to live a couple of months. Well, he's been around for 20 years. Last year, he was traveling in China, uh, Peggy's, Peggy's uh, Chinese, and he was traveling in China, and his organs started to fail. And they thought he was going to die in China. And unfortunately, they didn't have the travel insurance to get him a medical flight back to Canada where he could get the kind of treatment that might save his life. So in desperation, the family pulled together and sold uh, her, they sold her parents' house because they needed about $100,000 to get the medical flight from China back to Canada with all the attendant uh, medical professionals. This was not a cheap thing. But what would you do for somebody you love? You would do anything. And she was desperate, and they were desperate, and they got him back to Canada. And the doctors there were not hopeful that he was going to live. And, but Peggy was faithful, and she said, you know, let's... She invited... Uh, you guys have had uh, our brother Doug lighting up here preaching. She, she, Doug's an awesome, faithful brother, and... Uh, she said, Doug, you know, would you mind coming and sharing the gospel with my dad? And her dad really doesn't speak much English at all. So they went in there with Doug and got, you know, translated the, the scriptures and, and uh, Peggy translated and they shared with him. And, uh, you know, his health started getting better. And eventually he accepted Jesus and he got baptized and he's your brother in Christ today. And, uh, and recently, you know, they... You can clap for that if you want. Amen. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's awesome. You know, it's really inspiring to see a, a hopeless situation. Really, like, th this just looks so bad. You know, there's no hope. Uh, but God did something greater than we can imagine. You know, um, the doctors were blown away. They're like, we don't know what, you know, how this is even possible that... Uh, by the healing, now, they're probably not as impressed by the baptism because that's not part of their worldview, perhaps. But uh, they were blown away by by the recovery he was making. And the, Peggy, uh, at our, our Christmas service, Peggy and her dad got up and and sang um, in the English and Chinese a uh, version of Silent Night. And it was very beautiful to uh, to see to see them doing that together. <clears throat> you know, 
as beautiful as that was, it was, it was kind of challenging for me because, you know, my, it, was, it had been a few months since my mom had passed, and I thought, wow, you know, I wish, wish I had, you know, that experience that, that mom and I could be singing together for the church or something. And, it, and it, as happy as I was for my sister, there was a hole in my heart of pain of just, just missing my mom. And uh, there, there's a scripture, you know, that has really encouraged me. And it's got some similarity to the one we've read already. Let's, let's turn over to, to Luke chapter 8. We read about another person who was desperate for some help with his daughter. In verse 40, a guy named Jairus. It says, and this is uh, within the Jewish territory. It says, now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house. Because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And I guess skip over, we know the passage that Jesus is healing the woman who had bled for many years. But I want to I concentrate our, our, <laughs> our attention on, on Jairus, who, as he was traveling with Jesus back to heal his daughter, the crowds, you know, started forming around Jesus, and then this healing situation happens, and then all this, you know, Jesus is questioning what has happened, and who touched me, and so on, and, and all the time, you know, Jairus is probably sitting there, my daughter, come on, she's going to die, and it says in verse 49, while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, your daughter is dead, he said, don't bother the teacher anymore. So awesome day for the woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She got healed. Amazing. Joy. Awe within the crowd. And everybody had joy within that crowd except for Jairus. Because somebody came and said, your daughter's dead. And there's nothing you can do about it. So just give up and go home. Leave the teacher alone. He's got other people to help. And Jesus looked at him and he said, <clears throat> don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. Jesus said, forget everything that people are saying. Keep your eyes on me and you're going to see something greater than what you have imagined. And he went back to her house, and, he, and everybody's mourning, and, you know, she's dead, and all the stuff is going on, preparations for funeral. And Jesus is like, get out of here. She's just sleeping. And everybody's like, you don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. And they're, you know, kind of laughing. And they get, they get out, they leave. And he brings his Peter, James, and John and the girl's parents into the room, and he tells her, get up. And she wakes up from death. And her parents were astonished, to say the least, as one would be. But we see again in Jesus a situation that looks so hopeless. Death. What's more hopeless than death? I, I can't really think of anything. It is the most hopeless thing that you can encounter because there is nothing you can do once somebody's gone. They're gone. But God is able to do immeasurably more than all you can ask or imagine. And the scriptures do teach us, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. It's hard to face when we lose somebody we love. But God and Jesus, as he, like he said to Jairus, says, put your eyes on me and don't lose faith. I don't know, 
you know, what it all means sometimes, the ups and downs of life, the tragedies, the things that happen. But I know where my eyes need to be. They need to be on Jesus, who has the answers and who is able to do immeasurably more than everything I can ask or imagine. Many times in life, we don't have the victory to victory feeling that we would love to have. We don't see things unfolding the way we'd have them unfold. And our hurts can overwhelm us. Our dreams can be shattered. And we think, what good can come of this? What possible good, God, could you be allowing these lousy things to happen to me for? But you know, <clears throat> God can't do much with us until we're broken. He doesn't do much with those who haven't known hurt because we will not have the compassion, the understanding that we should have because we can't, we're just not there. <clears throat> to, I apologize in advance if anybody is not aware of this, um, but we lost one of our sisters recently, Sandy Duggan, who you may know Alex and Sandy Duggan from the central region in Toronto. Had, they had moved up north to Sutton and were attending a church up closer to their home there. Uh, Alex is a former roommate of mine, and, and uh, actually Alex and Sandy, when their first child was born, uh, lived in a, a basement suite in our apartment. So we, we lived under the same roof together, and they got to see more of the realness of my family than I probably wanted anybody to see, uh, more of my weakness and sin than I wanted anybody to see. So they were really close to us. I hadn't seen much of them in the last few years, but our sister Sandy, who uh, w was a nurse, had cancer three times on and off you know she got cancer went into remission got it again went into remission got it again went into remission and believe me if there's anybody who could have will powered her way out of cancer it was sandy she was a tough strong faithful stubborn sometimes a woman that was determined if anybody could have willed her way back to good health it was her <clears throat> the fourth time was too much for her. She had been on life support for about a month because some of the family were saying, take her off. Some of the family were saying, God can still do something great. Let's hang on. And eventually the medical professional stepped in and said, it's been a month. We're taking her off life support. And she left us. And she left this world <clears throat> with two children, Joseph and Soleil, who are nine. Excuse me at 11 years old. How do we look at that? <clears throat> Sorry. Sometimes you think you're okay with something and then you kind of get it to a deeper level. That's kind of what's happening for me. Um, how do we look at that, you know, for her kids? Um, uh, a lot of you guys probably know uh, a good brother, Rav Tour. Whenever somebody gets sick or dies, Rav's always like, lucky them. <laughs> like, okay, thank you for your faith, brother. <laughs> but really, lucky them. You know, we, we had uh, recently, uh, uh, we're blessed to have Guy and Kathy Hammond uh, down in Hamilton, who, uh, and you know, Guy used to lead the Hamilton Church. They're very loved there. And uh, as you guys know, Kathy's nearing the end. They told her with her brain tumor, you got one year to live. And then they said, actually, we've got to revise that. You have about six weeks. And that was about four weeks ago. And they came down and uh, they, they uh, re uh, showed guy, the uh, guy's movie that he made, which is incredible. Um, and they talked about you know, the journey of what they were going through. And she was radiant and faithful and awesome. It was, Guy said, don't worry about Kathy, she's fine, pray for me, is what Guy told us. Because sometimes it's harder for the ones left behind. You know, it was so inspiring to see their example. But you know, in the hurts, there are gifts and there are lessons. These things are hard, it's hard for children 
to see their parents go, especially at a young age. God put it on my heart to do something <clears throat> for these kids of uh, Sandy, um, which any of you who knew her are welcome to participate in. You know, one of the, the great comforts to me in the loss of my mom was people who would, you know, cousins and different people would come up and share things with me that were a, a window of insight or a story about my mom's life <clears throat> or something that she had done uh, with them or for them that I had no idea about. And some of them were really, <clears throat> really beautiful stories. So I have been kind of inviting Sandy's friends or anyone who knew her to, to contribute a, some memories and some stories. And we're going to put those into a couple of books and give them to her kids because without a doubt, those kids will want you know, <clears throat> will wish that they were able to know their mother a little better over the years. So if you have a memory to share, please come and see me after and I'll tell you how you can uh, connect with that information. We'll, we'll give those, uh, those memories to her children so they have a little, just a little piece of their mom through the memory of her friends to hang on to. <clears throat> I don't think I would have had it on my heart to do that project if I hadn't been through what I'd been through. I don't think that spark of compassion would have been lit within me if I didn't understand the pain of losing a mother. God <clears throat> brings good through the worst of situations. He can do it. <clears throat> and if you keep your eyes on him, he will do it. I tried to think about and ask people about what is the need of the hour for the Ottawa Church of Christ. I don't know how this all ties together as a message, but I guess I'd love to share from my heart my personal ex exhortation to you as a church. Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I guess it's really about us having the heart of God towards each other. We've seen God's heart. We see God's heart in Jesus when he wept for Mary and Martha, for their dead brother Lazarus, even though he knew he was going to raise him from the dead in two minutes. Jesus still wept for the sorrow of these people. We see Jesus of compassion for a little girl of a foreign culture, demon possessed. For a desperate father who was told by everybody else, give up hope because your daughter is dead. We see the continuing compassion and love and heart of Jesus in everything he did. And I believe that heart is shared uh, by the apostle Paul and we read this, this really cool, encouraging story of an example of our brother in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 12. He talks about <clears throat> an opportunity that he had, a good opportunity. In verse 12, he says, When I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, I found that the Lord had opened a door for me. Awesome, like, aren't you encouraged on any given day when there's an open door for the gospel to be preached and maybe you haven't even been that faithful and somebody walks up and says, wow, do you go to church? I'd love to go to church. And you're like, you hadn't even shared your faith in a month. And, you know, sometimes God just like knocks you on your heels with the doors that he'll open. A prayer for an open opportunity uh, to share the gospel, in my experience, rarely goes unanswered. I've seen crazy things happen. You know, I prayed, you know, God, give me an opportunity today that is, will be an undeniable opportunity for me to share my faith. I used to be part of a, a Toastmasters club at the place where I worked, and they had this thing where you get up and you do a one-minute impromptu speech. And they said, okay, here's the topic for your impromptu speech. What book has inspired you the most? And I'm like, well, 
<laughs> I can't say Lord of the Rings, even though that was good, you know. Um, like, if I don't walk through that open door, I'm a dummy, because God opened it wide out before me. I went into a class once in school, praying that God, you know, and it was an art school that was pretty worldly and kind of the opposite end of the spectrum from Christianity. And man, how do I share it with these people? They just, their view of the world is so different. And we had some funny classes that were just discussions about various things. And one day, you know, I was trying to have a Bible talk at the school. And one day, right before my Bible talk was going to happen, as his kind of assignment for the day, one of the students came in and he said, I was walking through the woods and I found a Bible in the woods and it had a bunch of passages highlighted in it. So I'd like to, uh, ju it was falling apart so he took the pages of the Bible and he handed them out to people in my class and said, I'd like us all just to read a little bit and it was like some, his intention was like some weird art thing. It wasn't even like, and I'm just like, okay, God. <laughs> Literally, God put me in a class of people who were not interested in the Bible and had them all sitting with scripture in their hands, reading passages from the Bible. And so I was like, well, on that note, right afterwards, there's a Bible discussion taking place in this very room. If you'd like to stay, you're most welcome. And everybody's like, thanks, bye. <laughs> you know, they, they all took off. But it just goes to show you, know, God can open a door in amazing ways. You know, it just makes me laugh at some of the things where he just, he opens it so wide, he's like, all right, dude, well, you know, what are you going to do? Um, you can't turn away from those ones. You got to walk through. But here's an instance where Paul said, you know what, open door, awesome. And believe me, if anybody wanted to preach the word, it was Paul. But there was something that stopped Paul from preaching. And he said, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. The one thing that Paul considered to be of greater value than an opportunity to preach the gospel was his relationship with his brother, Titus. And I think that shows the heart of God. God wants the gospel to get so much. He wants love that Jesus for us.